view of the starry night sky is simply breathtaking. But did you know that we can also listen to some of the cosmos's sounds? In the early 1980s, the Soviet research probes Venera 13 and 14 achieved something that no space probe had ever done before. They made the sounds of a foreign planet audible. Today, we'll show you the sounds that the probe duo captured on Venus. But how was it even possible to make sound recordings on this extreme planetary world? What is the scientific significance of these sound clips? And above all, what exactly did the Venera probes actually record? Be sure to stay tuned until the end if you want to find out what Earth's poisonous sister really sounds like. The space race was over. After the US became the first nation to land humans on another celestial body on July 21, 1969, it dealt the Soviet Union a decisive blow in the cosmic race between the superpowers. And although the first manned moon landing is forever immortalized in our history books, we should not forget that the Soviets did not simply shelve their space program afterwards. On the contrary, in the year following the much celebrated Apollo 11 mission, on December 15, 1970, to be precise, they achieved something that no one had ever done before the first soft or in other words, unmanned landing of a probe on another planet. However, it was a long and rocky road before Venera 7 made contact with the surface of Venus. At the same time, the first generation of Soviet Venus probes also reminds us how much our view of our planetary neighborhood has changed over time. Today, we know that Venus can confidently be described as a cosmic furnace. Due to the galloping greenhouse effect in its atmosphere, Average surface temperatures of 465 degrees Celsius prevail here, hot enough to melt lead. Added to this is the fact that the atmosphere of our neighboring planet consists of 96.5% carbon dioxide, supplemented by nitrogen, sulfur dioxide, and a few other elements. Furthermore, Venus is completely shrouded in a dense veil of sulfuric acid clouds. And as if this weren't extreme enough, the pressure on its surface is around 92 bar. This corresponds to the pressure at a depth of 900 meters below the surface of the Earth, and means that a human being without a protective suit would be crushed instantly. With this background information in mind, the following seems all the more astonishing. After it was leaked in 1961 that the Soviets wanted to send two probes to Venus, it was suspected in the West that they were designed to float in a full-grown ocean. In fact, until the early 1960s, it was believed that our planetary sister was by no means the prime example of a hostile, extreme world, but rather resembled a primeval Earth covered by oceans and jungles. The Bumpy Road to Venus Despite all this, the Sputnik 7 and Venera 1 probes were not equipped with special ocean landers, and these would not have been of much use anyway. And we don't mean the fact that there are no oceans on Venus, but that Sputnik 7 didn't even manage to leave Earth's orbit and contact with Venera 1 was completely lost a week after launch. Nevertheless, the silent probe is officially considered the first man-made object to enter the realm of Venus on May 20th, 1961. However, the first scientifically useful mission to Venus was celebrated in the West. After the Soviets suffered three further failures, Mariner 2 became the first probe to not only fly past our neighboring planet on December 14, 1962, but also transmit valuable data back to Earth. Venera 2 and 3 failed at this point, but Venera 3 did at least become the first probe to crash uncontrollably onto the surface of another planet on March 1, 1966. Ultimately, due to these sensitive failures, the Soviet Union decided to put its Venus ambitions on hold for two years and revise its previous approaches. This proved successful. After Venera 4 plunged into the vastness of space on June 12, 1967, it became the first probe to successfully deliver data from the atmosphere of Venus around four months later. However, at that time, it was not yet known how enormous the pressure on Venus was which is why the probe descended much more slowly than previously expected and was unable to reach the surface during its planned operating time. Despite this, it was able to gather valuable information about the temperatures and composition of the atmosphere. 
The situation was very similar in the case of Venera 5 and 6, which set off for Venus in 1969 and sent data about the atmosphere back to Earth for around 50 minutes before they too were crushed. But then the hour of Venera 7 struck, and with it the first research probe to land on the surface of Venus on schedule and above all, undamaged. It had been designed to withstand a pressure of 180 bar, during the 23-minute data transmission, it revealed that the temperature at its landing site was a scorching 475 degrees Celsius and also showed what was needed to develop a follow-up probe that could gather even more comprehensive information about this planetary poison oven. The failed launch of Cosmos 359 was followed by the successful mission of Venera 8, which landed on the day side of Venus in July 1972 and found that the planet's surface was as bright as a cloudy day on Earth. And although only 11 seconds of the total 50-minute data transmission from the surface were successful, experts knew from then on that Venus contains ammonia and that potassium, uranium, and thorium are present in its soil. Until then, however, we had been denied a direct view of the planet's surface. But after Venera 8 showed that photography on Venus was possible in principle, Venera 9 and 10 finally gave us the first, albeit low resolution, images of its surface three years later. And these marked nothing less than an outstanding milestone. This was actually the first time in history that we were able to catch a glimpse of the outside of another planet. More precisely, the black and white photos showed a relatively smooth terrain covered with stones and boulders. Venera 11 and 12 should have brought a little more color to the Venus game, but unfortunately, the covers of their cameras could not be removed. The mission of Venera 13 and 14 was a bit more eventful. Launched in the fall of 1981 and landing on Venus in March 1982, the probes delivered the first high-resolution color photos of the planet's surface. But that was not all. As mentioned at the beginning, Venera 13 and 14 were also able to capture the sound of Venus for the first time, achieving an audio milestone that had never been achieved before. Unique Sound Recordings – What Venus Really Sounds Like But listen for yourself. Isn't that fascinating? Even if the recordings are admittedly not exactly what we would call crystal clear, they do give us the unique opportunity to listen to the real sounds of another planet. Now, of course, the fundamental questions arise as to what exactly we are hearing and how Venera 13 and 14 managed to capture these extraterrestrial sounds for us in such detail. Well, basically, the immense pressure on Venus is accompanied by some interesting acoustic properties. The dense atmosphere transmits sound waves much more efficiently than it does on Earth. Against this backdrop, it's even conceivable that a person shouting loudly on Venus could be heard several kilometers away, provided, of course, that they weren't crushed to death first. At the same time, however, the surface pressure also causes the sound waves to be transmitted with greater attenuation of the high frequencies. This makes sounds on Venus sound very dull, deep, and muffled, almost as if they were being transmitted through a thick cushion or from great depths underwater. But what was responsible for the sounds captured by the Venera probes? Well, first and foremost, the wind. Although Venus rotates very slowly on its own axis, its atmosphere moves at an incredibly fast pace. In figures, this means that the atmosphere rotates around the planet up to 60 times faster than Venus itself. As a result, winds 60 to 70 kilometers above the surface race around the planet at speeds of up to 360 kilometers per hour. But on the ground, the wind situation is much more leisurely. Here, the wind speed is only about 1 to 3.5 kilometers per hour. But what sounds quite harmless at first glance means that, due to the dense atmosphere, even a gentle Venus breeze transfers a great deal of kinetic energy. So what we're dealing with here is a slow but massive hot stream that passes by like a thick soup. In the Venera recordings, the wind noises can be heard as a leisurely, steady, low-frequency hum, reminiscent of strong wind in a cave. Basically, 
we hardly hear any high frequencies here. Everything sounds somehow slower and as if shrouded in thick fog. At the same time, however, we can also hear isolated metallic clicks or scratching noises, which are probably caused by the mechanical inner workings of the probes. The same applies to the vibrations when the probes touch the ground, which manifest themselves as deep metallic vibrating noises. But how exactly did Venera 13 and 14 do this? Did they simply extend their probe arms and hold a microphone up to the Venusian landscape? Well, not quite. Strictly speaking, we're not dealing with sound recordings in the traditional sense, but rather with acoustic measurement data that was later interpreted as sound recordings. Among other things, the probes were equipped with special acoustic sensors that could measure seismic activity or pressure changes in the form of atmospheric winds. And the data collected was then converted into audible sound formats. And as mentioned above, the mission became the first ever to bring measurement data with acoustic information back to Earth. Although many other space probes had been launched into space before Venera 13 and 14, none of them had functioning microphones or comparable acoustic sensors on board that could record sounds from a foreign celestial body. Even NASA's early moon missions failed to provide us with the sounds of our satellite. But this was primarily because the moon does not have a proper atmosphere that could transmit sound through the air. And the bottom line is that the Venera recordings remain unique to this day. No other country has ever captured real sounds from Venus. They therefore continue to mark a significant milestone in space travel and impressively demonstrate that our thirst for knowledge can defy even the greatest adversities and most extreme conditions. And did you know that the subscribe button can withstand even the most extreme clicking conditions? Just click on the thumbs up and subscribe now to never miss another video from us. We'll see you soon.